So very good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of uh, Center for Plant Breeding and Genetics, the students and staff, I welcome uh, Dr. Gigi Joseph, a uh, professor in uh, Plant Breeding and Genetics from KAU. Uh, Madam is not new to TNAU, a regular visitor, and uh, she is a regular visitor to TNAU. And uh, Dr. Gigi, she got uh, an experience of around 26 years in plant breeding research. And uh, Madam is specialized in rice and pulses. And Madam, she has released five cultivars in rice and published more than 50 papers and high-rated journals and published three books and book chapters also. And Dr. Gigi Madam has guided around 10 MSc students and five PhD students. This is in nutshell about uh, yeah. Madam CV. And uh, now it is mandatory for every external examiner to have a lecture. So Madam has visited today to uh, complete the viva of uh, Ms. Moana Priya. Uh, she worked on rice. Uh, her viva will be in the afternoon. So I request you people to join the viva also. Now I request Madam to deliver her lecture. So good morning, all of you. Our respect uh, Director Revikeshwan Sir, Rajalakshmi Ma'am, uh, dear students, and I, uh, Ma'am. So, uh, in the beginning itself, I should thank uh, uh, the coordinators because this auditorium is something which was, and this podium is something which held by uh, many eminent breeders and will be. Uh, this podium will be holding uh, many eminent breeders in future also. So I thank the coordinators for giving me an opportunity to stand before you and uh, have a very, uh, maybe uh, a small talk on the climate change and uh, whether it is going to be a stress for the breeders. And we know it is, it is a stress. So how to manage and how it will be going to... Uh, so... Uh, so when I was a student in 6th or 7th standard, my teacher, uh, he was not actually my science teacher. Uh, am I audible to you? Okay. So uh, he uh, told, told us, we were very small students, like 6th uh, or 7th standard. He told us the human beings are going to uh, have a big head and with two fingers to feed that big head with the intelligence. So these two fingers will be to feed us. And we don't need any bulk, just some capsules or tablets filled with all necessary, all necessary nutrients to fill the big head, which is having the, all the intelligence packed into. And so that didn't happen yet. But these fingers, these two fingers are the most important organ of all of us. Am I correct or not? So you are operating everything with these two fingers. You have uh, computers, you have your phones, everything can be uh, manipulated or uh, controlled by these two fingers. So his prediction of using that time, uh, I am talking about my childhood days, that is somewhere around in seven, late 70s. So that time has come where well, we are using these two fingers but the other thing that is eating something in a capsule is not possible until we are having this kind of a digestive system we should have uh, a combination of carbohydrates proteins minerals and more than anything fiber to have a proper digestive system so the role of agriculture is not going to is it something happening here? Okay, okay. Is it okay for you to, am I, uh, if I am continue? Okay, so that uh, time has not reached where the agriculture, importance of agriculture is going to reduce, at least in near future, it is not going to happen. But the importance of medicine can come down, I don't know, again, if you stand in a cubicle like structure, uh, there can be different scanners scanning on your body and identifying what is the disease you are having. Uh, like the CT scan or MR, MRI scan you are having. 
the entire body can be scanned in uh, maybe in seconds and an artificial intelligence system can re reduce what is wrong with you and can prescribe some medicine and some uh, counters may give you them proper prescribed medicine by the AI system. So uh, again, that uh, I'm not sure, but the importance of agriculture is not going to come down in near future until we are revolved into having such kind of a big brain and with small intestine or something like that. So our job is job will be continued uh, until that period of evolution. Okay. So and again, uh, we are talking about the climate challenges. So when we when I join, when we means I don't know. I I'm not. Uh, sure with me, any seniors like me here so when we joined in the service I uh, like in uh, it was around 25 years back but don't count my age or my colleagues in age okay so when we joined the service as assistant professors uh, people were talking about uh, changing climate uh, but uh, it was not something which was believed by us and when I joined at uh, ASEAN and uh, Ray Madhuri uh, for my PhD in 1995, uh, when I was, I, I reached the campus by around uh, 5.30, 6 o'clock, and I was uh, hearing a huge cry, cat cry. So I was thinking, what is this uh, animal or what is this, uh, the, is crying. It was a loud cry of a cat. Only after two or three days, I could not I, I could identify it is not a cat. It is a beautiful peacock giving out this strange sound. Okay, I, I was I have seen the uh, peacocks only in zoos. I have not seen the peacock in uh, around me. And that time, 1995, I have seen the peacock near me at AC and Ray Madhuri. Now, after 25 years. I have a family of peacock on my on my terrace. They are residing there. Every day I can see the peacock uh, uh, dancing. So, and my husband, who is a forestry person, he is saying it is uh, the indication of uh, desertification. That is the arid nature, which was present in Tamil Nadu or some other dry part of India or world is coming to Kerala also. But I'm not ready to believe it, but that is happening. So the, uh, that is the climate challenge. Okay, so I'm going to, this is, uh, this will be a talk for, I will be concentrating on few important uh, um, climate challenges. Afterwards, we can, I, I have listed a few of the things based on my research experience. And uh, if possible, uh, we can have a discussion on that. So this is the situation here. The number of hottest days in India was around 40, 40 days total uh, during 1950s. But it has over a period of 70 years, it has come to 100 days of hotter days. So this is a newspaper clipping. Bahamas February in nine, 146 years has happened in the, this February of 2023. And this is the climate change and the change in monsoon and again we were uh, in Tamil Nadu you are getting somewhere around 100 centimeters of rain in an year but for us it is around 300 centimeters and it was distributed from June 1st normally when the school reopens the rain comes we used to carry an umbrella the first day of school opening June 1st but that has changed that has changed too and even in Mar April, March we get rain, April we get rain, uh, March rain means the paddy fields are in harvest, the summer crop is in harvest. When you get rain in March, the end year crop which is about to harvest is under flood. So we are, we, we are losing our grains which is essential to keep us survive for the next year. and. Uh, the rains which used to come in June, we are not getting enough rain. The distribution is changed. Th this June, we didn't get enough rain. And by the end of uh, around the 15th of June, one farmer from Palakkad called me and asked me, 
what we should do with the nursery which is about 30 days now the rice nursery we are not having enough water in the field by rain and enough water even in the now wells to pump in and to have the uh, transplanting so i asked them because it is a jodi variety you can't keep the nursery for long because 30 days itself is a long period for jodi which will be harvested in 120 days so he the farmer himself suggested me can uh, can we uh, remove the nursery and can we go for direct seeding so it was like that only because we are not getting enough rain during june and by now july 1st it started heavily raining and again i don't know how many of you will believe that yesterday night it was heavy rain in my place it is only 150 kilometers away from Coimbatore and until Balayar it was raining heavily after that and Coimbatore I'm feeling the hot okay so it is only 150 kilometers away from here uh, if I come by car early morning it will take only one hour because the road is very smooth uh, again I am not very sure about the traffic rules but uh, if a car is sturdy to cattle, the 150, 110 kilometer speed, I can come in one hour or one hour 15 minutes. Okay. So in that distance itself, you can see the change in uh, rain. But that is not uh, due to climate change alone. It is due to the topography and other things. And season and pattern has changed. And it has become an intense rain for a few days. And you can see the reports. Uh, 2023 and we are becoming we are going to a new normal which was not normal before has become a normal now and uh, you might have heard about the 2018 flood happened in kerala we never had flood in our state because we have got equally distributed rain starting from june until uh, end of october it was equally distributed and giving us a total of 300 centimeters of rain in an annual in any year but now the rainfall remains the same the total rainfall remains the same but it has come down the number of rainy days come down and the intensity of rain has got increased so the new normals are happening and in north you can see this kind of hailstorms and this is the most important of all that is the drought and it is the most important of all limiting the agriculture also so from 2019-97 when i completed my phd to 2023 22 drought has uh, uh, around 57 percent of the area is affected more affected by drought around half of the area which is under cultivation has affected by drought over a period of 25 years and nearly two-third of the country from 2020 to 2022 in two years time two-third of the uh, two-third of the country has in drought and again uh, salinity this is another problem and uh, there are two reasons for that one is the drought itself because we will be utilizing the irrigation water which is salt affected and that will be leading to salinity and the next is seawater intrusion then frost which was again happened in the north state has uh, creating lot of changes in the agriculture uh, especially on vegetable crops wheat as well as for mustard and brassicaceae family so these are few and next is the biotech stress and again if you compare between the biotech and the biotech stress uh, we may think that the biotech stress is more contributing to the loss in agriculture but it is not it is in the other way. Abiotic stress are contributing more to the loss in agriculture, but it is not that visible as abiotic, uh, abiotic pest or disease. Okay, so this is in natural about what is happening in the climate change. It is uh, high temperature, high intensity of rainfall, extreme weather patterns, and that will be leading to the abiotic stress and the biotic stress like new pathogens, new pests, uh, all those things and all this will be compounding have, will have a compounding effect on our agriculture and in general on the plants and again we have contributed to the pollution especially by plastic and uh, other things most important pollutant is plastic only 
but uh, i don't think uh, we can survive without plastic uh, at least for another 20 40 years because every we uh, especially in the medical field without plastics i don't think it they, they can survive so and again it has got so many advantages at the same time it has got a long lasting effect on the environment all these things is contributing to the contributing uh, to the reduction in agriculture uh, and gen in general to the environment and specific to agriculture which is the most important thing for us to survive so this is uh, a graph showing the losses caused by the biotic and abiotic stresses and again as i told before uh, abiotic stress are more contributing to the uh, reduction in uh, production and you can see a few of the crops listed here more than 50% of the loss is by the abiotic factors and the uh, lesser contribution is only by the biotic factors so we will see few of the uh, abiotic factors which are contributing more to the loss in agriculture and again i will be talking about few of the genes or physiological mechanisms and all and i will be leaving this slide here and if you want i can give you some reading materials also but uh, being breeders we should know what what is the mechanism actually happening during a particular stress only for that indication i am giving you a few examples on uh, the important uh, stresses especially on drought uh, then on uh, then on temperature only few examples i am giving with the detailed information after that uh, based on our practical experience what could be the solution again it is not going to give a perfect solution to any problem by breeders alone but uh, that we can see what can be done in this aspect so this is uh, about the uh, losses happening to the agriculture production through abiotic stress as well as biotic stress so you can see uh, in 1950s our population was somewhere around 36.1 crore and in 2020s it has increased by four folds uh, to 142 crores but the agriculture or the food grain production not in the agriculture or the entire agriculture but the agriculture uh, is actually men uh, in especially for our state it is both of horticulture as well that is commercial crops like rubber uh, which is not a food crop uh, but for the food production uh, has uh, increased by six fold from 40, 50 million tons to uh, 315 million tons so uh, the increase in population even though it happened only four times uh, the agriculture food production has increased by six times so we don't have any difficulty in feeding the population now but we don't know what will happen in future okay and with again with the climate change and other things the biotic and abiotic stresses if the food production is coming down and the population is expanding in the similar rate uh, we may not be able to feed the entire population so we are now in a very comfortable position whatever poverty is reported in our country is not due to lesser food production but because of the parity in supply or the resource allocation is uh, limited but if you can supply in, in a uniform way we don't have any difficulty in feeding the entire population for now so we with food production uh, india is in a very comfortable position now but we don't know what will happen in future so for that the breeders as breeders and as agriculture scientists we should be ready to face the situation what will happen in the 2050s or later okay for that only we are concentrating as breeders and again most of this contribution on food production is by uh, any other division people are here only breeders okay so we can be very proud that this change happened over the period of 70 years in india that uh, increasing the food production six times is most majority of the contribution is by the breeders from developing high yielding varieties introducing new varieties or new crops from other places and acclimatizing them 
making uh, fertilizer responsive varieties again people may have criticism over that also but without that kind of development of varieties if we are still using our traditional varieties our production will be the same only with the varieties and suitable agronomic practices and again there is pest and disease management strategies as well we could contribute this much to our country for the food production so for the climate challenges we should think of uh, new crops then new varieties and modify our varieties available varieties to suit the requirement of the challenges okay new crops means i don't think uh, ma many are available but for at least for kerala we have an option of going for millets and all which is a drought resistant one but again uh, again there can be question like uh, how much area is open open area is there for cultivation of millets in kerala it is not an easy task to find out area even though it is a stress tolerant variety of crop but millets cultivation cannot be extended to the larger area in kerala because we don't have much area much open area okay and for uh, tamil nadu i don't have any suggestion for any new crop but we can have new varieties which are having climate resilience and again modified existing varieties to suit our requirement of uh, uh, climate stresses climate or uh, pest or disease stress uh, or biotic or abiotic stresses so coming to the most important and most limiting uh, this is the most important and most limiting factor uh, in agriculture and again i was talking about its impact can up to Uh, on a whole uh, scale it can go up to 50% and if a complete drought is happening in an area your crop can be lost fully okay if you I, i was talking about an example of a nursery raised by a farmer in the beginning so they couldn't transplant that crop because they were not able to do the land preparation activities to transplant it so that means the whatever they have invested in the nursery is lost so it is a complete loss of crop okay. if he has taken to the field again after 40 days a particular uh, rice variety is transplanted immediately it will be entering into flower and it won't yield even half of it okay so uh, so we need to uh, address this problem of drought and again uh, this prolonged exposure of drought especially during the reproductive phase can uh, re can result in complete loss of the crop uh, flower production grain filling seed composition as well as well as the seed longevity even the storage life of uh, seed can be lost due to this particular stress and again uh, if you want to see some mechanism which are happening uh, to mitigate dr drought stress in plants that th this is the most important mechanism that is the closure of stomata the plant is trying to keep its water inside it does not want the uh, does not want the water available inside the tissue to go outside by transpiration so it is trying to keep the stomata close but by closing the stomata it is uh, giving another uh, pressure on the plant like Uh, the stomata is a uh, stomata is opening where the carbon dioxide is getting diffused so it will be resulting in the lesser diffusion of the carbon dioxide and that, uh, again directly uh, influencing the photosynthesis and uh, this uh, and again it will be resulting in uh, uh, ros production that is Uh, reactive oxygen species which is actually an essential component in the normal system but if it is not a scavenger it will be resulting adversely on the plant and this will be impairing the photosynthetic apparatus and at the same time the water flow the stomatal flow by water flow through the stomata through transpiration will be resulting if it is affected it will be resulting in the leaf overheating and again the mass flow of water water flow is essential for the absorption of nutrients from the soil once the flow is arrested by the closure of stomata the nutrient uptake is arrested okay that all these things will be resulting in lesser 
uh, narrow lesser photosynthetic area as well as lesser photosynthate and the final productivity getting affected and again i am going to give you a few genes associated with this so these are some uh, closure uh, genes which are associated with the stromatal closure there will be and again we know the drought will be firstly affecting the root system it is finding the root is finding difficult to get enough water so some uh, small molecules will be produced by the root system and i have listed the 25 and all so these small molecules will be moving up to the leaves to indicate that some stress has happened at my point root is saying oh uh, I am not getting enough water, so I am getting starved. So I am sending a few molecules and close the stomata to keep water which is stored inside the tissues. Okay, so this is happening. The root derived small molecules produced by few genes moves to the leaves and giving a, a symptom that or signal. Uh, which is actually perceived by the BAM complexes receptors, and that will be accumulating, resulting in the accumulation of the abscisic acid, finally resulting in the stromatal closure. Okay, and again, I was talking about the reactive oxygen species, which is again produced by the plant system, which is which will be also uh, regulating the stromatal movement. So the hydrogen peroxide will be activating the receptor. Uh, HPCA1 to open the calcium uh, channel and asking the plant, asking the leaf to close the tomato, stomata so that whatever water is preserved inside, whatever uh, water is present inside the cells can be preserved. And again, the drought can result in higher accumulation of protease enzymes as well as the nucleases, especially the RNA enzyme. So that will be degrading the proteins as well as the nucleic acid, especially the RNA. And again, the drought can increase the nitrogen reductase activity, which will be in red, red, uh, reducing the uh, nitrate forms into ammoniacal forms. And again, this all these things finally result in uh, reduction in the starch as well as which will be the finally accumulated to yield. Okay, so these are some of the mechanisms the plants are having. Uh, like uh, this water loss can be prevented by thicker cuticle. Then changes in the leaf anatomy like the histological modification of the leaf. Like more of a palisade tissue, they can accumulate more of carbon dioxide. They can store more of carbon dioxide. And if more spongy tissues are there, the carbon dioxide movement within the tissue, within the, uh, within the uh, leaf tissue can be monitored. So the changes in the leaf anatomy, and again, we have studied about the CAM plants, the crassulation acid metabolism uh, in plants, where the stomata opening is not happening during the daytime. The stomata of CAM plants will be opening during the nighttime where the temperature is slightly lesser and water retention can be more compared to the normal uh, plants. So these are some of the uh, incurrent mechanism available in plants, but we, this mechanism may not be present in our varieties. The thicker cuticle which is present in, uh, uh, present in uh, plants which are present in the drought prone areas as well as in uh, deserts, we cannot expect to have this in our normal plants like rice or wheat or sugar cane. We cannot expect. But there are mechanisms in plants which can prevent the water loss. And again, tolerance to drought can be by contracting the water potential by regulation of osmoticum in the plant. We, the plants will be producing so many osmoprotectants in the plant inside the system to uh, regulate the water loss and again reducing the uh, impact of secondary effect by inducing antioxidant compounds and uh, 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 students who are working with uh, drought tolerance might be studying about uh, they will be estimating different components like uh, by uh, biochemical components by uh, like uh, proline uh, then dismutase catalase uh, all those enzymes to find out all these things are acting as an osmoprotectant to prevent the uh, drought stress completely affecting the plant. Then uh, I was talking about drought stress when it is uh, uh, 
when there is an indication of drought the immediate response is from that root okay roots are the first one going to uh, recognize there is a limitation of water surrounding me then only it will be signal to the leaf tissue so this is the root study is the most important aspect which again the other people are criticizing us like we were always the breeders were always concentrating on the above ground path we were not bothered about the root below because we have no we have no facility to evaluate a root system if you want to evaluate a root system of rice plant during the ma maximum tillering stage we need to pull it out and see what is happening at the that stage it is not possible because it is a destructive method so root system study was limited until now and because may we have to concentrate on the components by seeing the architecture of leaf how many number of panicles are present how many branching all those things we were bothering much but now the drought has uh, turned our interest to roots as well and again the studies on roots is very difficult and uh, mohana priya i don't know who is she okay uh, i think i have done your phd qualifying examination also okay so uh, she has studied about the root architecture uh, keeping the plant in a uh, pvc pipe and again uh, how many of you can how many of not you how many of uh, we can afford to have such kind of a structure if it is running into a huge emplasm thousands of plants we need to evaluate we may be restricting to some 30 entries 40 entries 50 entries we can go for this uh, structure but it is not possible if it is a huge emplasm of 2000s or uh, 3000s so and again you are not going to find uh, this kind of a proper uh, ideal root uh, architecture with the 30 or 40 genotypes okay so that is the difficult thing why breeders are not concentrating on root architecture it was because of the limitations we faced seeing and identifying the root architecture but the drought us uh, actually forced us to study the root architecture it spread its angle and whatever it is exudating all those things we need to study now if we want to compare drought in a better way so these are some of the things root and their plasticity deep and branched root and it is again you ask uh, uh, our students of agriculture we know the important what uh, the import what is the importance of root in absorbing the nutrients as well as water from the soil we need if we can have a better biomass distributed over a large area uh, the root can access to all whatever is available in their vicinity maybe it is water maybe it is nutrients that will be absorbed by the roots and it will be translocated to the uh, sink that is the leaves to produce maximum photosynthesis okay so these are some of the genes the uh, or uh, drus this uh, deep rooting uh, genes which are present in some of the uh, plants as well as some of the varieties can be a can be a good indicator or can be a good candidate for the breeders to work upon the like deep rooter genes and it is available in rice gemplasm not all varieties but few varieties are having this gene and they promote deep rooting and maintains high yield under drought conditions and again this uh, this uh, deep rooting genes are, are reported in case of maize and other uh, field crops as well so the maize gene zia maize uh, dr01 modulate root angle and again the root angle is very important because it needs to be spread maximum to absorb whatever is available in their vicinity if it is in a narrow angle it will be going deeper and it will not be taking the nutrients which are somewhat away from the root zone so it uh, the diazomas dio dro1 modulate the root angle its expression under stress is associated with a higher yield but again there are some limitations of availability of stress regulated genes because if it is a gene which is present always which is expressed always and there is no stress situation the genes will be always expressing it 
for its deeper and uh, wider ankle the roots but it is not essential when there is enough water it is not essential when there is enough water this deep rooting uh, gene should be active only during only during stress situation so this present ectopic expression could be in a disadvantage because energy will spent for this particular gene to always in action but that energy can be utilized if it is in a perfect situation of there is no drought and that is why many of our drought tolerant varieties are not popular among the farmers because they won't be performing better than the available varieties in the ideal condition only under stress they will be performing better than our normal varieties okay so that is why our tolerant varieties are not popular especially the bad abiotic stress tolerant varieties because if the farmer is having enough irrigation if the farmer is getting enough rain then this varieties may not be performing equally well as our traditional not traditional our high yielding other varieties okay so this uh, is Uh, a negative effect of this particular not for this particular gene alone whatever genes if it is a universally expressing every time it is expressed means it will be definitely having some energy to spend for its expression and it will be having a negative impact on the uh, plant and again the positive effect of root architecture is demonstrated by incorporating the drought or dro1 dro1 gene from potato to arabidopsis so this is a more uh, this is a important gene which is having an effect on the root architecture and finally resulting in stress tolerance drought stress tolerance and this is uh, a picture representation we need to have deep root with wider ankle or uh, with this less surface root all the root should be going downward to Uh, find out the water, and again the root biomass should be more than that of the aerial biomass. And again, uh, see the histological part. They should have root cortical file number more, steel diameter more, root uh, cortical area in chyma more for the uh, movement of the carbon dioxide and the xylem vessel. Then denser root hair uh, with the uh, top and primary do uh, bigger top. Uh, primary root diameter and again the last point that is the exudate or the mucilage this is actually for harboring mycorrhiza the you might have studied about the um, uh, am uh, mycorrhiza associated uh, my mycorrhiza associated with the root zone and this will be again having a positive effect on the drought tolerance so all these things as a part of root structure can impact on the drought tolerance and this is again another mechanism roots hydrotropism that is the roots will be able to move towards water so when uh, the the water available in the soil may not be uniformly distributed around the root zone so it may be present in a uh, in a larger quantity at one one uh, side of the root zone then the plant root should move to that side and absorb all the available water which is present only at one side of its zone okay so this is a root mechanism the food root uh, hydrotropism so uh, this is again uh, channeled by some of the genes and uh, this osea genes are characterized in many of the field crops like uh, barley soybeans and maize so they will be moving towards those plants having this particular gene will be moving towards Uh, the roots will be moving towards the water zone and will be absorbing more of water which is available in that region this are uh, some of the genes again uh oryza sativa or ca1.1 which is mediating uh, many aspects like stromatal closure seedling survivor as well as for hypo or uh, hyper osmolality osmolality as well as salt stress so breeding for drought stress should focus on these aspects okay when you are planning a breeding for drought stress for any crop we should uh, plan metabolism i was talking about many of the biochemical compounds which are regulating the drought uh, situation in the plants 
the prolines, catalase enzymes, super oxide, dismutase, many, many other, which are, are having a positive effect on mitigating drought. And again, leaf structure and its anatomy, which is, is important. And we, because the st uh, stomatal closing is happening at the leaf level, and of all, root is more important because they are the one which is going to affect the first level. So the root structure, its architecture, and its responses are very important when you are thinking about breeding for drought stress. So, and again, this is very easy to say, and Mohana Priya knows how difficult it is. And again, we can see the challenges later. So I'm moving on to the next stress that is, and again, next important stress, it is salinity. So approximately half of the irrigated land is affected by salinity. And again, it is increasing day by day because of the drought as well as human practices. Because when you are going for a deep plowing, we are taking the deep soil, which is having some kind of mineral inside and taking it up. Okay. And again, when you are using some kind of uh, saline affected water for irrigation, it is going to accumulate over time. So weathering rain with the sea water, sea soil content, land clearing, irrigation, all these things are increasing the salinity stress. And that is also going to affect the plant growth, development and production. And it is by two factors like induction of osmotic stress. Uh, and that will be again resulting in the absorption, uh, redu reduced absorption of the nutrients and water from the soil, and again accumulation of the toxic compounds in the inside the plant system like sodium. So, and again, uh, there are some genes which will be regulating the ionic and osmotic balance, and again regulating the leaf development on the onset of senescence. So these are some of the genes associated with straw, salt resistance. The SOS gene, that is um, salt overly sensitive genes. So this will be responding immediately from the root and uh, they will be giving some signals uh, to uh, make the plant not to absorb too much of sodium or salt from the soil. Okay, this is uh, principal determinant, determinant of the sodium metabolism and it will be making the plant not to absorb too much of sodium and extrude the sodium from its soil. So and uh, again there are uh, some uh, SOS genes uh, which will be acting in many plant system to extrude. So that, will, that is why it is overly, salt overly sensitive genes. So this uh, overexpression uh, significantly increase the salt tolerance. So they will be acting so that more of sodium is not absorbed by the plant, by the root system. And this is present, orthologue members of this SOS family is present, available in uh, rice, maize, tomato, and all these things are, all these varieties having this particular gene is expecting. Uh, hypersensitivity to salt. That is, they are not allowing the so sodium to get absorbed in more amount and deposited in the tissues. And the next is ROS mechanism, that is the reactive oxygen species. Along with the ion channel, they will be assisting and uh, they will be preventing the accumulation of too much salt in the plant. One system is, one mechanism is you are not allowing, the plant is not allowing the salt to be absorbed in too much. It is extruded. And the second is accumulation is prevented. So these are, uh, uh, so this ROS has, uh, is, uh, uh, ROS is generated by RBOS gene in response to salt treatment. But again, this ROS, reactive oxygen species, if it is, in a signaling level, it is a good advantage to the plant. If it is in more, if it is produced in more large quantity, it will be affecting the plant in a negative way. Then the ion homeostasis, that is the sodium potassium concentration inside the cell is uh, modulated. And this is one of the mechanisms which is present in rice. So again, you might have studied about the saltol, which is present in our varieties, the Pokali varieties are harboring the gene saltol, which is a dominant gene, which is uh, the mechanism 
which is giving the salinity tolerance to our varieties is the homeostasis of sodium and potassium. So it is associated with the maintenance of sodium potassium ratio in the salinity tolerance. And again, uh, uh, it the QTLs are uh, already identified and marked and again it is marker assisted selection and marker assisted back crossing to develop high yielding varieties using saltol as a gene is, uh, is in progress and many varieties has developed through incorporating saltol as uh, and the main mechanism is mannose binding lectin they are uh, they are the actual uh, contributor for the iron homeostasis which is in the plant cell and that is controlled by the salt all qtl then uh, so for the salinity tolerance the salinity tolerance the breeder should go for uh, aim for the genes which are associated with the sos ros and mbn M. so these are the uh, the breeders idea should be for going for identifying varieties or incorporating these genes which will be either acting as a overreacting or over sensitive mechanism or homeostasis in the plant system and i will be talking about only one more stress that is a heat stress which is again uh, in the first slide i have shown you that in 1950s the hottest days in india was around 40 and it has come up to 100 in 2020s so somewhere around one third of our days are hotter compared to the previous years so this is definitely going to affect the plants so so there are two mechanisms this is there are by thermosensors they are these are the molecules uh, which will be changing their configuration and that will be the changing the configuration will be acting as a sensor and this sensor uh, acting as a signaling molecule that configuration change of this molecule will be sig changing some signals and it will be leading to the physiological as well as morphological alterations in the plants so some of the examples for thermosensors are uh, cngc family uh, they will be giving the thermo tolerance and Again, this will this is associated with the calcium signaling in the plant, and and one of the member is the annexins. So it is a multifunctional protein family, and this has identified in many of the field crops like rice, uh, barley, wheat, and tomatoes. And this change in the protein configuration will be. Uh, moving at two places that is once the temperature high temperatures is identified by the plant some proteins will be acting and they will be changing their configuration structural configuration and that change in the structural configuration will be acting as a signal and that will be moving to the plant parts to change their morphology or physiology or biochemical pathways so and the next is the thermosensitive, uh, thermoresponsive genes and they are one of the example is the phytochromes and uh, they are phytochrome interacting factors or the PIF family. The other one is uh, annexins family, here it is PIF family and again this family uh, proteins are also associated with the wheat, tomatoes and rice. So high temperature tolerance is present in our germplasm but again we have to find out and again you might have studied about one rice variety n22 or nagina 22 and have you seen the plant how is it how it looks it's a very lanky plant with very short duration actually but it is very lanky and uh, the uh, one particular thing is it is producing roots at the nodes even in the aerial parts of the nodes also will be producing roots as well as some kind of uh, tillers from the uh, that nodes not from the soil part it is producing some tillers or a kind of branching but it is very low very poor yielding uh, very means very poor yielding and uh, but it has got the uh, genes for drought tolerance as well as high temperature tolerance so one of the major breeding objective in rice is to transfer the genes which are associated with drought tolerance as well as temperature tolerance in the N22 germplasm into our cultivated varieties and many works are happening in, uh, throughout the world as, as well as in India and again 
uh, from this university only we could identify the uh, Kirby set tolerant uh, mutant from N22. And I remember Robin, sir. So this, uh, this is uh, one is term temperature, uh, thermosensors, and the other is thermoresponsives. Then uh, these are some of the genes again associated as a thermosensor ELF3, which is early flowering uh, gene 3, which is present in Arabidopsis, barley, and wheat. So uh, if you screen for genes associated with any kind of stress, it will be available. But only thing is, only thing is identifying the material. If you have a gemplasm of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, it may be present only in one plant. And how difficult it is to find out which plant is having our resistance, whether it is a uh, abiotic stress or biotic stress. That is the point where the breeder is finding a difficulty. Okay, so we will come to the that point later. So uh, other important uh, signaling components are the in thermos uh, temperature sensitive toler the temperature tolerance of protein kinases. Then ROS is acting everywhere. Then the uh, tra diff different transcription factors. So this is again uh, MAPK is. Uh, uh, protein kinase gene, then this all these things are associated with heat tolerance as well as and they are present in many crops like rapeseed, tomato, maize, wheat, and rice. Okay. Then this uh, this heat shock proteins again you may have heard about heat shock protein which is associated with the temperature uh, stress tolerance and it is again available in many of our this. Uh, alternate splicing is confirmed as a novel component of heat shock memory in wheat, barley, rice, maize, and tomatoes. And again, here what we have to target is target for uh, CNCGs, PRFs, ELF, and MAPK and HSF. And can help the breeder to develop varieties or develop plants with temperature tolerance. So this is in nutshell what I was talking about until now. All are press, uh, expressed here the, where the drought is acting, where there is a salt stress, where, is the, where there is a high temperature stress. And again, one of uh, action is giving on the cold stress as well. Uh, and I can share this article as well. Uh, it's a review article. Uh, again, um, Many of the things I have taken is from that article, but few things are coming from other articles as well. So this is an introduction about the major stresses, and we have seen, and again, we have seen many genes are associated with uh, almost all the stresses. Okay, so why breeder has to stress? If the genes are available, you have genes available, you have the mechanism unraveled, then you have you are seeing many uh, many varieties of rice, maize, wheat, barley, tomato are processing this mechanism. Then why breeder has to go for a stress? Because the mechanism is available, but that mechanism we we, we don't know where it is present and in which gemplasm. And even if present, even if it is identified, we cannot use it directly because. As I was talking about N22, which is having good tolerance to drought as well as temperature, is a very poor yielder. And it is not at all appealing to see even. Okay, whoever has seen that crop variety might be, see, uh, might be knowing about it. Okay, so there lies the stress of the breeder. And then coming to the biotic stress, and again I was telling you, this is compared to the abiotic stress, this is less, but we consider this as a major important factor but because we don't know the uh, extent to which a drought can uh, create yield loss. So see this, again, up to 50% of yield loss can be happened by abiotic stress and in many crops. Okay. Uh, uh, animal pests, wheat, pathogen, and again, when you are talking about abiotic stress, we always bother about pests and diseases only. 
we don't bother about animals which is a major pest especially the wild boar and the peacock even and again we don't uh, care about weeds also because there are different uh, methods by which we can control weeds effectively we are more concerned about the insect and pathogens but all these things together will be contributing equal to the abiotic stress okay so the abiotic stress is more important when it comes to the yield loss again abiotic stress uh, again i'm not going to deeper into it because it is uh, it can be a course or it can be a even a degree msc program in abiotic stress uh, biotic stress on uh, the both pathology and entomology people are dealing with it and it can be the stress tolerance can be at the morphological level you might have studied about different types of trichomes available in plants which will be harboring which will be helping to harbor the uh, insect as well as which will be preventing there are two types of uh, again depending on the uh, depending on the organism which is infesting your crop the trichome can be a uh, advantage for the insect to lay eggs they can call the there and lay eggs there but they can be in a different way and in the case of uh, this tomato and all we have seen that this glandular trichomes will be preventing the colonization of white fly which is a transmitter of which is a transmitter of many of the viral diseases so the glandular trichomes the morphological path then anatomical path if you have a thicker like thicker cuticle in the case of drought tolerance if you have a thicker uh, pericarp it will be preventing the insect to bore upon that i have got one experience again this glandular trichome is also one of my experience with the tomato leaf curl virus where the glandular trichomes the, the not the number of trichomes are important but the number of glandular trichomes are impa, important in imparting resistance to uh white fly and the same way uh, the thicker the pericarp it is giving a less uh, less uh incidence of brinjal shoot and fruit borer thicker pericarp and uh, bigger diameter for the fruit and again uh, when so these are some of the anatomical things and again histological tissue uh the more the spongy tissue the can be more so like that both and morphological anatomical histological and biochemical components when there is more of protein and more of sugar the insects will come to that plant so what we want is also the same thing we want more protein and more sugar so the insects also want the same so were the interest of the breeder and the insects come together so we can't compromise we can't compromise we can't go for a bitter tomato only for bitter god we can afford to it but we can't go for a bitter tomato we can't go for a bitter brinjal we can't go for anything bitter other than bitter god is it so the insect preferences are also the same they prefer more sugar more protein so insect entomology or the uh, among the this is my opinion uh, the pathology people may have another opinion so it is difficult to compromise okay we can't go for something which is beyond a particular level of protein you can't uh, go for recopy with 10% of protein which is not affected by maruka at all the pot borer you can't go for it because pulse means we need to have a protein of more than 20% if it is more than 20 25 30 it is more good but the insect also prefers that so over the uh, interest of the insect and the breeder comes together the same interest but we can't compromise for their preference okay that again will be one of the challenges faced by the breeders so these are the by uh, the different uh, biotic stress tolerance it can be at the morphological level it can be at the anatomical level it can be at the biochemical level or it can be at the histological level i'm not going to explain it this uh, how much time is for me this now uh, now only i'm going to 
actually going to the challenges half an hour okay okay uh, how much time i took until now this is the most important aspect of our challenge the breeder is facing with uh, both biotic as well as abiotic stress whatever genes are available it is not a single gene whenever we are talking about a dominant single gene controlled resistance it is something which is impossible i say because none of the mechanism none of the mechanism which is giving you a resistance to whatever be it biotic or biotic can be controlled by a single protein is it possible no so whatever you are talking about as a single dominant gene controlling a resistance to uh, some insect pest or some pathogen it is not we may be identifying something as a major gene but it is not a single gene it may be even a oligo gene not a major gene or major qtl so this is the most important challenge a breeder is facing the polygenic polygenic activity of all stress tolerant genes then the different mechanisms are acting in different plants different varieties and in different populations of the same variety can you imagine a population which is having which is in the f2 generation and the f6 generation will be acting differently because the genetic constitution is different the first population the f2 population is in highly heterozygous population so some of the genes may be in heterozygous condition and or some of the genes may be in a recessive condition contributing to a particular resistance but when it comes to the f6 generation all genes are in a homozygous condition we might have missed the recessive gene which was in the homozygous condition in the f1 f2 and that resistance may not be acting in the same way in that f6 population but the original cross is the same okay so this is again a challenge for the breeder different mechanism in different plants different varieties and again in different population so we need to find out where our desired mechanism is available if you are lucky it will be present in a variety simple back crossing maybe a marker assisted back crossing will help you to incorporate the desired desired gene of our interest into our background but many of the times it is not that is why even though the marker assisted selection has started some 50 how many years back any idea when was the first uh, mass variety released in india and which was the variety hmm? improved pusa basmati when it was released and how many years it took to develop the variety is it 25 years of history of mass almost we can consider it as a 25 years of history of marker assisted selection or map but still now how many varieties we have we commercial varieties no i am not talking about the varieties uh, no the uh, lines we have or not commercial varieties how many varieties are the we can count in fingers is it we have the pusa improved pusa masmati then improved samba masuri then you have the sorna sab one how many again if you see the all india uh, all india level it is something which is which can be counted in now uh, fingers not more than that more than 10 not more than 10 okay so this is what happened uh, even though we have the genes identified it is very difficult to transfer it into our desired background because your preference for rice is different from my preference we need bold red kernel varieties which is very difficult to swallow for you people but for me the fine rice is okay so i am going to relish my lunch even even if it is not a bold a uh, red kernel the variety but for you it is not possible uh, the students from outside states in our college used to complain madam this mota mota rice it is very difficult to swallow it won't take any sabji so our preference is different so that is why 
even though you have identified the genes associated with drought resistance uh, blb back uh, BL, not blb it is bacterial blight when we were students it was blb now it is bacterial blight only so this is the different part and again the previous one the polygenic trait and there is no uniform protocol for identifying your resistance it can be at the morphology level it can be at the biochemical level it can be at the histological level it can be at the molecular level we don't have any uniform protocol to identify okay this can be the protocol to find out a resistant gene from my maize population no for each each or metabolite each morphology trait each it is different so we don't have any uniform protocol to follow and again this i hold it at all preferences are the same ex especially for the insects and even for fungus they need sugary uh, fruits or sugary leaves and with more protein it is more for their survival so preferences are very difficult to compromise then in many cases the artificial screening is not possible and again i am talk uh, i was talking about the uh, experience of mohana priya how many gemplasm she can do with this if it is running into running into thousands of how much cost it will be involved uh, and again your director was talking about the fund limitations and it is the everywhere at all sios maybe some private companies can afford to it but what they need is profit at the end of their investment in lakhs to develop a variety with drought tolerance and again i don't think they will prefer drought tolerant variety will they i don't know and come this investment many of this case and again in the case of insects and pests many are not rareable and uh, again i have got experience of maruka vitreta the uh, the um, pot borer in pulses or uh, it is not at all possible to rare it even if we rare it it will be producing eggs and then next generation is not at all feeding they don't born they born only artificial food they are not ready to feed on to the natural population and similar way many many fungal strains the powdery mildew you cannot culture only what we are doing is we will be cutting the sample from the infected tissue and keep it on to the on to the normal plan to uh, infect it many of this artificial screening is not possible and even if it is possible it may not be representing the field condition so when you are doing the drought situation you are creating in, in a small pot that is not the situation when the plant is taken to the field it is going to affected by many stresses rather than a simple drought stress so artificial screening is not possible even if it is possible it may not be representing the true true field situation okay so and again seasonal variations you may not be able to screen your material until a particular season is come especially for drought and all we can induce and you keep it in the rain out shelter we can induce some but for pest something which will be appearing only Uh, during the monsoon or something uh, many are there so it seasonal variations are difficult to breed and again we need to screen large population then only we can identify where our material is present and induced stress may not be similar to field stress and this is the most important limitation limitation in facilities and we are talking about the criticism on breeders that we breeders were always seeing only the above ground plot we were not uh, bothering about the root zone because of the limitations of facilities if you have a uh, mri or x ray there are facilities like that you are you are doing the and previously we used to do the radio isotope studies to work the spread and all and it is not possible now so the limitations of the facilities is the most important challenge for the breeders especially in the sios or the public sector uh, facilities 
then this is I, something which we need to think over like uh, i have listed the challenges but this is where the breeder should think like uh, the green super rice you might have studied about the green super rice which can perform better even under low input especially on low nitrogen it will be performing almost equal to the super rice uh, under low input situation so we need to find out gemplasm or resources which will be performing better under limited resources then that is not their natural uh, evo evolution but it is for us we need something which will be performing on a sustainable way with lesser input it can be lesser input can be in terms of fertilizer lesser input can be in terms of lesser pesticides or irrigation so we need varieties which can be performed in a sustainable way under low input situations and green super rice is one of the example and again it is not that easy as we are saying here but uh, at least some of you should work in that aspect and then we have now we have the accelerated breeding facilities like uh, speed breeding and uh, shuttle breeding facilities when we were students uh, we used to take we can take only three crops in an year for annuals verb we the duration is 3 months the maximum three crops but now with speed breeding facilities we can go up to six generations in an year but again we need to create such a situation or create such a speed breeding facilities so and again shuttle breeding this is more important in case of uh, pest and diseases you would make your material develop your material at a place and take it into another place where the incidence is the like sick plot or the environmental conditions are suitable for screening in that area and uh, you may uh, you might have visited our wellington station where the shuttle breeding facility is available for rust screening okay so this is again one of the most important aspect the breeder should think of the accelerated breeding facilities to reduce the number of cycle to increase the number of cycles or generations we can handle in an year then the third point is the first challenge i was talking about stacking of genes maybe one or two genes may be showing resistance now will not be showing resistance after 5 years and the same same way that is the gene which is showing resistance in coimbatore may not be giving me a resistance at trichu so the strains of bacteria strains of virus stray or by type of the insect might be a different one so stacking of all available or all reported at least all reported genes into a common background will be a durable resistance and again i can tell you about the tomato leaf curl virus uh, 10 uh, markers 10 uh, genes have been already reported and uh, the last season we have identified one material which is having perfect resistance and was not harboring any of the six genes so its mechanism is something else the six genes which has already reported is not available in our material but it is showing resistance so something else is some something else is giving resistance in our material so like that the whatever genes we have introduced to few materials from avrdc and whatever they have reported as resistant at their place is not showing resistance at trichu okay so stacking of available major genes will give you a durable resistance and again it is not easy as i am saying here if you can work on the same crop for maybe 20 years at least 20 years you make you can come out with a variety with all accumulated genes in multiple stress resistant okay so it is not something which is uh, possible as i am saying here then we need to have an accurate phenotyping it is again very important those who have worked with uh, the stress and uh, again for other uh, simple yield itself we need an accurate method of phenotyping whatever observations you are taking it should be accurate in 
not the observe that is the uh, measurable observations even the qualitative observation should be accurate then only the final result will be a perfect one then the pre breeding uh, i will say this is the most important breeding aspect to be considered for giving you a stress tolerant material because we will be having many material and again that may not be having all the desirable things so if uh, people can keep a pre breeding stock with uh, let us consider maize plant you have a pre breeding material with your drought stress you are having temperature stress tolerant material in one pool you are having uh, some uh, disease resistant material in another pool so you have a pool of different uh, maize gem plasm having resistance to different materials so you can the breeder can come and pick the pool which he is desiring and use this material into in uh, by into the breeding of that plant because our preferences are different you come to that pre breeding pool collect the material and nbpj has initiated a pre breeding uh, uh, activity with uh, i think with few crops now it is not possible to consider all the crops simultaneously they have started uh, developing few materials with incorporated especially for virus resistance and all binti sesame and all. they have the nppg has started initiate uh, and uh, they have initiated few works in pre breeding okay, so these are some of the things i want to discuss here and uh, i am not stopping the slides here because there can be many things to add on these are all some of the things based on my experience there can be thousands of experience by your teachers by your seniors and by you to add on to this challenges as well as to the practical things so this is here i stop uh, if you want to discuss anything please and if you want to add something on to this especially those who have with experience please do that so i'm stopping here here and uh, uh, i'm uh inviting few questions from you thank you now it's open for a discussion students you may ask questions so if you are not asking questions i will feel it in two ways that is you understood everything which is impossible and the next is you didn't understand anything okay that is that can be possible because i i wanted to say in the beginning itself i am not a uh, i am not a good speaker and i am not a good teacher whenever i am going to take class especially on genomics and all i always feel attention here because i know i am not covered fully as the next previous day yesterday might have happened something which i i may not have read and every day genetics and its application in plant breeding is going and again in this even the students may be knowing better than me but i am paid for it so i am taking the class so like that i am uh, i am not a uh, not thorough with everything available in this subject but uh, being a breeder for last 25 years i have few experience with uh, rice pulses uh, and again few vegetables especially on stress breeding biotic as well as abiotic so um, yes yes please good afternoon ma'am i am manandra vali do my first msc here uh my question is uh, with regarding to the root architecture that you were root architecture you were explaining uh most of the times when we see or read about drought tolerance and root architecture it's always about the root length but we never talk about the lateral branches that we can develop over the roots why is it so uh that again i don't know why they are not mentioning the lateral branches not only the lateral branches uh even the root hairs then the root exudate it's all important it's all important and the root volume its spread its angle everything is important and uh, and again it is not easy to measure and when you are giving a restricted environment like uh, mohana priya did you are keeping the plants in a very small structure it will be go- growing in that structure alone but that need not be the actual structure when you are taking it taken to the to the field but we are comparing everything in a similar environment similar situation similar uh, diameter uh, plastic uh, 
the sink cylinder so uh, we can assume that this particular material which is having more root volume uh, will have the same kind of effect outside also compared to the other one because we are giving the same environment and again i don't know why the people are not uh, going or my why the people are, it is not easy that is one thing that is why breeders were concentrating only on the upper part of the plant and again uh, when you are getting a material with good yield you can be very sure that it is having all associated things with it okay it need not be something uh, which is already recorded but many of the things associated with its growth and development will be there because our ultimate aim is for a yield so it will be taking uh, it will be having a good uh, root to absorb more nutrients more water it will be having uh, more metabolic activity to fix the carbohydrate all those things will be available in that material okay i am used to compare this as something like uh, again it will take time okay so i don't know why they are not bothered about the other things maybe the limitation of uh, study but you need to study all these things to actually to have a perfect picture of the root and its uh, contribution to the drought tolerance thank you ma'am ma'am you have told about uh, green super rice yes uh, this term is new for me can you just elaborate how we can produce green ah uh, have you heard of green super rice yeah what is super rice no no i am not going to confuse you green super rice is uh is actually it is again developed by china only and it is uh the rice varieties which can perform under low uh, there are different uh, different types of uh, uh, this thing like one can act under limiter irrigation okay but it will be yielding as good as a hybrid rice somewhere around 12 tons not 12 but 6 7 8 tons okay and green is sustainable okay so that is why that may be the reason they are uh, coincing uh, that term green along with the super rice and it can perform under low nitrogen that means again you are reducing the pollution reducing all other things and again there can be varieties which can perform under which can be which is having uh, resistance to pests and diseases again they can survive under pest or disease incidents but it will be producing as good as a normal rice so that is the term and again they have released few varieties even in green super rice it is sustainable a varieties of rice which is having high yield uh it is always in controversy that leaf rolling trite no huh? leaf rolling that leaf rolling trite, trite. Ah. Uh. it is always act as and we can say it is one of the mechanism for an a drought tolerance but in selection of an a drought tolerant variety we have to select a zooplasms or in lines with an unrolled leaves but contrarily we can say it is one of the mechanism can you add some point on it mm, leaf rolling is an actually the uh, it is again like the closure of stomata it is also a plant mechanism to make the leaf area reduced so that the uh, transpiration is transpiration is lessened okay like uh, stomatal closure the leaf uh, leaf will be rolled and that will be preventing the maximum leaf area will be reduced and that will be preventing the transpiration loss but again we will be uh, taking the material which will be rolling at the later phase the susceptible varieties will roll fast okay the varieties which have the tolerance will be rolling at a later day okay if you see the especially in case of rice and all we have the uh, varietal scoring uh, if it is if it is rolling on the fifth day of withdrawing irrigation and if you have a material which will be rolling only on seventh day the seventh day rolled plant will be considered as a drought tolerant one because this plant is sensing it and it is immediately trying to lose it uh, and like customary closure it will be having a negative effect on your yield because it is reducing the photosynthetic area and uh, uh, all those things so uh, our preference is for something which will be rolling at a later stage even though it is an indication that it is having uh, immediate response to the stress 
but we need something which will be rolling at a later stage i, I think it is definitely definitely that is why i was talking about that uh, uh, deep rooting gene in case of maize it is an ectopic expression and again i was telling about you uh, the varieties which are drought tolerant is not getting popular among the farmers because under normal situation the other varieties will be performing better our stress tolerant varieties will be performing better only under drought situation because they are expend, expending lot of energy to maintain these mechanisms so that is why uh, there there was one slide uh, so uh, this in case of maize the deep rooting it is an ectopic gene but only if only when it is required if you have a gene which will be performing or which will be acting only when it is required until that it is silent so in that case it will be better but i don't think it will be easy to find out a material which is having an expression which will be triggered only under stress it will be there always making the plant spending some energy for its retention but we need it because we need a variety which will be performing better under drought situation as well so it is definitely a loss of energy no doubt about it so but under situations like this we cannot afford to have a complete crop loss in those situations our material will be okay and again that is why we need something which is green which will be performing better even under low nutrient low irrigation or resistance to pests and diseases and again it is not that easy as i am talking here and again we have started uh, again i am not sure about uh, uh, your university we have started uh, with the crispr editing in uh, again I, i should also tell a few points about it crispr editing again seems to be a very fancy uh, fancy uh, this thing that is just find out the gene uh make a guide rna go there and cut it your susceptibility is gone your material is going to be sturdy resistant everything it will be absorbing lot of nutrients but it is not that easy it is easy to delete it is you need the complete sequence of that material untraveled without even the snps uh, level then you need a perfect transformation system without that you cannot to go uh, target your guide rna need to go and bind there and again the targeting is itself is difficult and again i was talking about the polygen there is no there is no trait as a genetics i am very sure that there is no trait which is controlled by a single gene there can be major qtls there no no character can be controlled by a single gene so if you want to edit can you edit thousands of genes simultaneously no but again there are varieties developing with major genes okay so we have also started doing this uh, and again with uh, varieties which have the protocol for complete regeneration we cannot go for protocol uh, we cannot go for varieties which don't have any a uh, protocol uh, regeneration system as well as transformation system uh, most of the studies are limited to lab only uh, what do you think the uh, main reason apart from resource allocation and all what is the main thing that is not coming to feel level especially on salinity i can tell you whatever salinity resistance you are seeing in the seedling phase seedling phase is not something which we require and most of the screening is happening at the seedling phase it is very difficult to screen a plant in a hydroponic system where until it's harvest because it is very difficult to uh, impose stress especially the salinity stress to the plants in the reproductive phase but the salinity stress is not something which can be uh, actually expressed in level of yield or in field situation so that is again one of the challenge i was telling in case of abiotics both abiotic as well as uh, Uh, biotic stress tolerance whatever you are doing in the field cannot be uh, replicated in the field the field situation is entirely different it is highly complicated when you are giving a stress for drought you are just withdrawing the irrigation is said drought stress means you are withdrawing the irrigation but it, when it comes to the actual field situation 
along with drought there can be temperature stress happening above the plant and there can be again salt salinity because the water is in a high osmotic cup because all, whatever is available it is getting depleted the minerals are getting released so along with the drought there can be even salinity and the high temperature so it that all these situations you cannot be replicated in a lab condition so and but again we are coming out with varieties which are having salinity tolerance and uh, this university itself has got uh, many varieties having drought tolerance your co53 uh then the paramugudi variety uh, uh all are having drought tolerance but again why people are not taking it it won't give you uh, the best yield under normal situation when you have the irrigation facility when you have in a frame this co53 may not be performing as like your uh, other variety okay and the field situation will be a complication of all these things and again when i am taking a medicine for simple fever no fever leave it i am taking a medicine for cold you are taking another med same medicine for cold your cold may be relieved in a day my cold is still there it is true biological system my reaction to the medicine may not be the same as your reaction to the medicine we have seen the corona some didn't have any symptom but their pcr result showed they are infected but some had very severe symptom so this is a biological system like any of us the plant it is having so many things to and again we are saying and that is why i'm say i told you when a breeder is picking up and again when i was a student of my phd my chairman was dr n sharif he was working with cotton and he was about to retire i, I was very young uh, compared to you uh, compared to my age now i was 25 when i 24 when i joined for my phd so i was with so many enthusiasm i didn't have any field experience i was uh my msc work was in tissue culture that time a high end uh biotechnology work uh, my chairman told me the best method of breeding is single plant selection single plant selection is the best method of breeding he was about to retire and he was maybe he must be having some 30 years of experience in field research but i was just wondering how can you say this because i have studied about all the population genetics biomaterial techniques quantitative genetics i should do a population analysis and find out the best one but he said no the most important method of breeding is single plant selection but now as a breeder i know what he said is correct because whatever is there if you are having if you are seeing a particular plant in high yield when all pl other plants are not yielding good that plant will be having all the biometrical attributes all the biochemical attributes all the bio uh, chemical attributes which is suitable for that plant to survive in that situation and performing better than the other plants okay so pick the plant but we should call that intuition or well, this is the best okay that may not be due to a more water availability that may not be that should not be due to more fertility in that region but it should be performing better than all other varieties because of its inherent property so what he told at that time i understand at this point after 25 years i understand what he told us correct he that we are not seeing for any other thing now we are phenotyping for reach and every individual character and say with uh, so much uh, statistical tools you are saying this is the best and same breeding thing he did that time maybe 55 years back with a simple intuition that this plant is going to perform well under this situation when all other plants are not performing good so uh, breeders intuition and again you might have studied about the definition of plant breeding what is the definition of plant breeding huge definition it is an art and science the first is art then only the science comes what is art it is your performance your individual or group performance then only science comes so that is why a breeder should 
have more intuition than science of course science is important and all these things are helping us in different ways to find out the scientific reason to it but whatever material we have developed in the previous years i especially in the early years it is based on intuition rather than science it is based on science uh, art rather than science so brader i yesterday also i was telling my uh, daughter and my niece that a breeder is like god we are creating we are creating new gene combinations which is not available or which is not present in nature okay so this breeder should have all these things uh, and we should be multidisciplinary also we should be uh, thinking about the agronomy part we should be thinking about the physiology part we should be thinking about the entomology part we should be thinking about the meteorology part so we should be all a jack of all trades and master of none why we can't use markers for easy screening ma'am no that is what i am telling you uh when i had the experience of tomato leaf curl virus i was having functional markers six in number with me okay but and i had a material somewhere around uh, 50 gemplasm of tomato and i screened all these things under field condition by artificial means okay and uh, some of the plants which were uh, resistant which were resistant were not having any of the six markers identified so can i re reject that material because whatever reported gempla whatever reported markers it is tomato leaf curl virus is a uh, lot of studied uh, this thing only so whatever material whatever markers available is not working in my, my material does that mean that this is not something which is not genetic i should understand that it is not because the markers it is because it is not because the inherent uh, genetic capacity is not the but the markers are limited something else must be working in this material because this is an indigenous material uh, one of my colleague collector from a street that may not be having the same gene as the marker so there can be and again people should work on more on this marker you don't know in everything about all we don't know everything uh, in a population maybe we may be knowing when we started with uh, bacterial blight in rice first we were talking about uh, xa21 only the kuldeep singh worked with xa21 in punjab then it will it break down then we were talking about xa5 13 now there are and we were trying to incorporate all the five genes into one pool but now we know more than 25 genes are active and maybe in next year somebody will say more than this there are another gene is there so we don't know and if you are getting all the markers available with the particular resistance it will be easy but for us abert extras it is polygenes we may not be able to find out all the markers all the different mechanisms associated with the stress to no ma'am i tell you one story about drought how we indian serious about drought china have good productive area but they import rice from india they serious about drought drought tolerant all the things why they have good productive area high uh, high area good variety but not cultivated rice because we not calculate rice production uh, water water price not calculated they calculated they have very less price world market say they are important otherwise i won't be standing before you telling about the breeder stress okay but again we don't know how to manage it it is not that easy i am say as we are saying uh, I, i cannot control the monsoon Is it possible to, for me or all of us together can control the monsoon when it is arriving, when it is receding? We don't know. And again, about uh, what you are saying about China importing rice, similar way, uh, we Keralaites are importing everything from outside, and we are selling the commercial crops like rubber. And again, now the prices come down. Still, we believe that with the money we are getting from 
Mughal for with the money we are getting from uh, US can survive us. But I don't think that will be a long term uh, sustainable solution. Uh, we should think of especially on uh, and uh, this agriculture is not only for production or food alone. It is for the environment as well. When you convert a paddy field into something else, the water retention, water recharging, uh, all those things are affected. So agriculture is not for food alone. It is for the environment and for our survival also. No, ma'am. Groundwater continuously decreasing. Uh, one kg rice, five thousand liter water. Another crop, less water. So why, why can you think about eating something else for your lunch on a continuous basis? Ma'am, because it is our habit. No, uh, Michael. How can we battle then climate change and drought? No, that is why I was telling about new crops. But I don't think I can eat a millet every day for lunch. I don't think I can because I am acclimatized. I am used to rice, uh, and again I can't even eat biryani every day. Even though I say I like biryani, maybe one or two days a week I can go for biryani or sandwich rice. Other than those days, I should go for my preference. Maybe my preference is slightly modified because I used to purchase uh, rice grains from Balakad and all the pani rice because it is easy to cook. But for my father, if I ask him to, uh, when I when my father came to my place some years back, uh, I served him with uh, pani rice. He asked me, "What is the sterilized rice?" Yes, it appeared to be a cotton bowl, sterilized cotton bowl. Okay, he can't. It is our habit. You can't change immediately. Maybe years to come, we may go back. Uh, we may come to a stage where we can cow tablets. Instead of our uh, idli, dosa, pongal, or anything, we can simply have a tablet in the morning and go to work. But again, the digestive system also should be acclimatized so that we don't need any fiber, we don't uh, need any bulk. So uh, it is uh, to be considered by all of us. And again, the climate change, uh, whatever we are seeing, is not that. Uh, the especially on temperature thing india is uh, is not creating law not lot of uh, this green gas emissions and all compared to europe or us our climate change has happened only 0.5 degrees centigrade rise in temperature average temperature but for other states it is more than that 1.5 degrees and all but again regarding monsoon and all uh, i can't explain it Uh, I, I, even I don't think a meteorologist can explain how to control the monsoon and all. But as again, it may time may come, science may develop, but now we can't. Only thing is contribute less to the pollution by cultivating your own, use less plastics, uh, then share your food so that food is not wasted. It is again very important, very important. I was talking about the. uh that food uh, six times increase has happened but still we have poverty in india because it is not because of not of it is not uh, lack of availability but the distribution so uh, thank you uh, uh, thank you rajalakshmi ma'am and again uh, dedication sir for me and all all participants for me giving me this chance of uh, standing before you and especially on this podium of uh, uh this university of uh, 100 and and 112 years okay so i am also part of this university i completed my phd from uh, sc and i madurai and again i am happy that i could have three gold medals in the name of ms swaminathan uh, ramayya and i believe appa dure also three gold medals i got at that time 97 Uh, you can don't count my age hmm? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all and uh, we always send our students to this university uh, for msc as well as for phd and we consider this as the best university near to our place and i always ask my students to come here and uh, at least go outside k k u uh, at least because this is the nearest place and the best university available 
in South India. But YSR is saying next year onwards your seats are going to reduce. And again, that will be definitely affecting our students also. Uh, so that concern is there everywhere, the funding. And uh, that is a major concern for the breeders in the public sector. Uh, so anyway, thank you all uh, for listening to me. And I want all of you, all of you to be a good breeder. Don't uh, change to bank or something else. Because it is, again, uh, it is very difficult to find a job at, uh, at the public sector now. But still, I want all of you to be in breeding and uh, contribute to India. Again, you can go out and come back and work, with, work in India. And even if you are going out, again, you ca we can't help. Uh, but even if you are going out, work for uh, something uh, good for our country also. So thank you all. Good afternoon to all of you. It's immense pleasure to propose vote of thanks for this occasion. First of all, my gratitude to uh, Dr. Gigi Joseph Mab, Professor and Head, uh, Department of uh, Plant Breeding and Genetics, College of Agriculture, Kerala Agriculture University, Trishur. Ma'am, it's a really wonderful talk uh, about your lectures, trendy topic. And uh, students also very interactive uh, mode, uh, raised many questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam, for your uh, wonderful lecture and uh, discussion part also, Madam. Uh, thank you once and all again to you, Madam. And also I thank our director, beloved director, uh, CPPG, Dr. Ravikishan, sir. He was the instrumental for us. He only arranged uh, Madam's uh, special guest lecture. So I am very much thankful to you, sir, for arranging this guest lecture by ma'am. And next, uh, I thank all the faculty members uh, who have participated this uh, guest lecture. And PG coordinator, madam, to assemble the students participate this uh, grant uh, manner and finally my dear students and uh, you all actively participated this uh, guest lecture and uh, bombarded them with the questions uh, particularly many students asked very critical questions I want to tell one question raised by root architecture um, I think Selvarani or who, who raised uh, uh, root hairs related question, Anandavalli. Okay, uh, good. So I will share the material. I had that uh, root architecture material uh, book uh, released by uh, Antonio and uh, along with uh, Dr. Raji Veshni, Springer book. Uh, that is one of the important book for uh, uh, drought uh, stress related root architecture lecture genomics. Uh, it's a very wonderful day. Uh, we had very nice lecture today. It is a, a really memorable day, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, one and all, everyone, thank you one and all again. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you.